the development of a fertilized egg, a single cell, into a whole human being seems to defy belief. It's like some kind of biological miracle. But that egg contains all the information needed to make a baby that will grow into a child and on into an adult. Over the years, scientists have uncovered many of the secrets of that incredible transformation of a single cell into a whole living organism. Cells divide countless times to make tissues that grow and fuse, fold and dissolve in an intricate but reliable way to make a myriad of different living organisms. But development isn't just about cells multiplying. They also need to change into different cell types. This process of differentiation produces skin cells, bone cells, the cells in your liver and your spleen, the cells which form the crystal clear lens in your eye and the neurons in your brain. In organisms that reproduce sexually, information comes from the joining of male and female gametes. Whether the organism is a plant, an insect, a human or a zebrafish, development of the fertilized egg produces a miniature version of something about midway between its mother and its father. Understanding this incredible process of growth and patterning isn't just fascinating in its own right, it is hugely relevant to human health and modern medicine. So join us on a journey of discovery into the fascinating world of developmental biology. So at its core, developmental biology investigates how genes, cells, and the signals they use to talk to each other generate an organism's heterogeneous size, shape, and structural features. This all happens in the astounding but highly reliable process of development from embryo to adult. It tells us about the differences between species and the similarities between individuals, or even twins. twins. Some 200 years ago, Charles Darwin wrote about how embryonic development may be the key to understanding the similarity and divergence between species. From that simple statement, we have gone on to understand that developmental biology involves a complex set of processes including cell division and migration, patterning and morphogenesis, and cell differentiation and regeneration to give us the many cell types that make up our tissues and organs. So Helen, I'm a PhD student also working on fruit flies, Drosophila. Can you tell you about this word morphogenesis? Yes, so morphogenesis is a really fundamental process that happens in embryos and actually within tissues within the embryo that really helps them develop their shape as an embryo develops. Now the fruit fly Drosophila has been really instrumental in helping us understand how these morphogenetic events happen and that's because the fly embryo, just like a human embryo, undergoes many morphogenetic events such as dorsal closure and gastrulation which really help us understand generally how different morphogenetic events in us happen. So dorsal closure in the fly involves the migration of two epithelial sheets over the surface of the embryo and those two epithelial sheets move across the surface to seal a hole in the embryo and they have to zipper up to close and seal that hole and that's a very similar process to, to wound repair. And ultimately what we want to do is use the insights from our work in the fly to develop new therapeutic approaches to help us accelerate tissue repair in the clinic. So we work on how the embryo develops and we work at the really the earliest stages when uh, very fundamental differences are set up such as which is end of the embryo is going to be the head end and which end it's going to be the tail end and how the heart which is the earliest organ to form how that uh, uh, emerges and how it's shaped so that it can do its job properly. So the heart starts as a, as a disc which then forms this linear tube and then from it's there that linear tube is going to undergo this really complex bending and looping morphogenesis which then gives rise to the heart. 
So my lab is really interested in understanding how you take this sort of seemingly simple heart tube and you turn it into a really morphologically complex organ. And we're particularly interested in how the environment around the cells influences that process. So within the heart, for example, there might be different extracellular environments made up by this thing called the extracellular matrix that are different in different regions of this simple heart tube that allow that simple heart tube to fine tune the different shapes that it's going to make as it's undergoing morphogenesis. I wasn't always interested in how the heart forms. What really got me into how shape emerges is plants. So Tom, animals undergo these complex morphogenetic processes. Is this similar in plants? It's very similar in, in a sort of conceptual way, yes. Uh, so morphogenesis, as in animals, is critically important in plants to make functional tissues. There are lots of differences too. Plants are surrounded by these cellulose cell walls uh, that are there to, to help them keep their shape and to stop them bursting. But that means that cells are connected to their neighbours for life. They can't move, they can't change the neighbouring cell. They have to solve that problem of morphogenesis uh, without being able to move the cells around. And how can this knowledge be applied? So if you consider something like a leaf, the, the bottom of the leaf is covered in small pores called stomata that are there to allow the exchange of gas and water with the atmosphere. And so if you can understand the mechanisms by which stomata are patterned within the leaf, then you can work out how to optimise the, the number of stomata to achieve that goal of more photosynthesis for less water. We've learnt a lot about how plants, trees and crops develop by studying a simple plant called Arabidopsis. Similarly, much of what we've learnt about human development has come from work on so-called model organisms from the animal kingdom. So we work with the, the mouse, which is a great model for mammalian development. Just like humans, it has a four-chambered heart. It is mind-blowing. During a development, things are very, very fluid and continuously changing shape. Things which are seemingly separate objects merge together because their component cells can allow that to occur and then form new shapes. Developmental biology can show us how cells move, bend, and change their shape to build the early structures of life. Perhaps the masters of this kind of migration are the neural crest cells. Hi, Karen. Can you tell us about this wonderful population of neural crest cells? So neural crest cells are a really interesting population of cells. They arise in the embryo of vertebrates, so they form at the back of the head, and then during embryogenesis, they crawl out, and then they have to crawl through the embryo really long distances to innovate their target tissues. So that is, they have to basically invade the organ systems that they're going to become part of. The neural crest cells are unique because they have the capacity to become all different kinds of cells, um, ranging from bone and cartilage in the head structures, to neurons throughout your body, to the pigment uh, in your skin, uh, as well as things like uh, neuroendocrine tissues. When things go wrong with the neural crest, things can go very badly wrong, leading to congenital anomalies, but also to pathologies such as cancer. A lot of cancers have hallmarks of embryonic neural crest, so they're multipotent, they're migratory, and they travel long distances. It's amazing to look down a microscope and to see this intact system coming together. I get to look at these beautiful embryos. I get to see life developing. I get to try to put together the, the, the pieces of the puzzle. And I get to try to figure out what goes right, what goes wrong, and how all of that's put together. These zebrafish embryos are minute. They are less than a millimeter across, but there are already organs here. I've seen the beating heart. I can see blocks of muscle tissue forming. All those organs are already starting to function. And this development is being driven by the information that's contained in the DNA that was there in that single fertilized egg to begin with. That science, developmental biology, is driving huge advances both in biology and also in human health. So this one is from around 24 weeks of pregnancy um, and you'll see it's, com it's almost completely smooth and just the first few primary folds that are forming. 
This is now at 30 weeks, so that's more similar. When we consider something as complex as the human brain, it's amazing that its development happens so reliably. But it's not completely determined by genes. Environment also plays an important role. If we look at identical twins, who are natural clones sharing the same DNA, the detailed structure of their brains can look quite different. The process of developmental programming is remarkably consistent and precise in some areas, but allows for variation, personalization in others. In our lab, we are very interested in brain evolution and evolutionary comparison, and also trying to understand what is so special about the human brain. I work with the cerebral organoids uh, and, in general, organoids in the lab, and we use them to study and look at development and evolution. So an organoid is a sort of miniaturized version of an organ, although it doesn't really look exactly like an organ. We start from stem cells and we aggregate them and they basically form and arrange to form parts of an organ and partially recapitulate its function. We can generate organoids from uh, individuals with uh, certain mutations that would lead to neurodevelopmental disorders. So we can then study and generate these organoids and understand how the cells that are mutated in that sense uh, behave in a 3D environment and we can then test potential different treatments to reverse that there's still a, a lot that we don't know and there's a world now that is opening with questions because we have now a new tool to use to answer them. So Rod, can you tell me a little bit about eye development and what types of questions you ask in your lab? So initially the eyes will develop from a single group of cells that come from the same region from where the brain develops. But this group of cells will bud laterally and form left and right eyes. So how does this progress further? So later, the eyes will undergo extensive cell rearrangements and foldings to form the neural retina and the retina pigmented epithelia. The neural retina will have all the neurons that enable sight. The retina pigmented epithelia, or RPE, will give shape to the eye and provide the physiological cues to sustain the cells in the neural retina. Developmental biology reveals an astonishing world within us. But for all the excitement that comes with a scientific discovery, what creates real, tangible impact is the end application. A breakthrough treatment, a human story, like the recovery of someone's sight. We're introducing a new paradigm for the treatment of diseases at the back of the eye. A new paradigm because what we're trying to do is rejuvenate a part of the eye where those cells do eventually stop working and die. The crucial thing for the whole program was understanding how those cells are first born. How do they actually develop in our bodies? Taking this whole program forward wouldn't have been achievable without having that developmental biology underpinning how we actually make a stem cell turn into an eye cell. It's actually life-changing for those individuals which are given a second chance for sight. I hope we've been able to share some of the wonder of developmental biology with you. It's an incredible story that origami-like transformation of a single cell into a whole organism. And this science is about a fundamental question, of course, one that all children at some point will ask, how are babies made? We're getting closer to answering that question and it's a huge team effort. It's really difficult to get your mind around it. There are lots of moving parts uh, and it is just so counterintuitive. It's absolutely beautiful. It's incredible being able to watch this process as it happens in a living organism. There's so much we don't know. There's so much to learn. There's so many questions we could ask. Not enough time in the world. Isn't this the most incredible science? 
it makes me want to come back and do another PhD.